as we worship you, as we minister to you, O oh Lord, we give you glory. We say, be thou exalted in this place. Be thou exalted, King of glory, King of kings, Lord of lords. You know everything, O oh Lord, by your spirit. Your spirit search at the deep things of God. Holy Spirit, we subject ourselves to you tonight to teach us, to bring us to the level of glory that Christ shared with us when he left the earth. We thank you for pointing us to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you for each and everyone whom you have thrown, O Lord Jesus Christ, to be in your presence. And we declare by your word that in your presence there is fullness of joy, there is pleasures forevermore. We lack nothing, O oh Lord, because you have made us to be kings and priests. A kingdom you have given us. A kingdom of kings, a kingdom of priests. So we bless you, Lord. We bless the Father for doing an amazing work in the cross. We bless the Father for always speaking to us. We bless you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we thou exalted in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much can give the choir a big hand. Thank you so much. Before you take your seat, can you just greet three people next to you and say welcome to the kingdom of glory. Welcome to the kingdom of glory as you take your seat in God's presence. Thank you so much for coming. Every time we appear in the presence of God, he's king of our lives and we thank him for sending the word in the season and reminding us about who we are in his kingdom. The kingdom of God is a glorious kingdom. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of glory and we ought to walk in this glory because the Lord Jesus Christ left to us a covenant of glory which we're about to see and how we are supposed to live this covenant of glory that our Lord has left us on earth. So we will begin our scripture reading today from the book of Revelation 5 verse 10. Revelation 5 verse 10. It's a wonderful account of who we are. So we'll start from that position of who we are in this kingdom that Christ is serving as the king of kings. The Bible says that he is the king of kings. Who are kings? Are the people who are in my presence today. Look to your neighbor and say you are a king in the kingdom of God in the glorious kingdom of God. Thank you so much. So we'll read in that account, Revelation 5, verse 10, but let's begin from verse uh, 6, for clarity's sake. John is testifying here by the Spirit that, I'll read from the King James Version, if you can give us the King James Version, Revelation 5, verse 6. He says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified in the heavenly court. He stand as a lamb that had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirit of God sent forth into all the earth. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. From the Father, verse, na, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the four, 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden veils full of adores, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. Kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So we see from this account that the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross, his resurrection works, he came to give us a kingdom, and he has called us in this kingdom. Not slaves, not servants, but he has called us kings. So we'll start our reading today from that account, from the position 
that we are kings and priests in the kingdom. And one of the characteristics of a king is that you rule, you reign in life. Now, you might not reign in the physical world because we know whom the God of the world is. But in the spiritual kingdom, where Paul in Hebrews 12 says that we are now in Mount Zion, which is the heavenly Jerusalem, that's where we take our reign from. Because the king who we are serving under is in heaven as we speak. And he has made us on earth to be kings and priests. And he says, therefore, that we shall reign on earth. We shall reign on earth. So the position is of a king who is an inheritor, a king who has, who has been partaking of this commonwealth of Israel as we are about to study the next scripture. So from that position of a king, I want you to know that God has made you as a king and as a priest unto his kingdom. So all the prophets we used to read about in the Old Testament, sometimes we adore them as prophets, as kings, but God says in this new covenant, in this new kingdom he has given us, we are even more profitable because now we have the spirit of God in us, the spirit of God in us. We draw from the heavenly account what he has given us, which is a spiritual kingdom about the invincible realm that God dwells because the Bible says in Colossians that Jesus Christ that he has given us, he is the express image of the invisible God. And we know that God is invisible, is immortal, and he has given us a spirit to connect, to approach his throne by his spirit. So we'll start today by really emphasizing that we are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. We are kings and priests. Look to your neighbor, I'm a priest and I'm a king. I'm a priest and I'm a king. I'm a priest and I'm a king. So in this glorious life the Lord has given us, he expects us to manifest that glory. Because there's no point that God give us a glory and we cannot manifest that glory. In fact, God is so bitter and lamenting when his children, they don't showcase or demonstrate his glory. I'll show you in the scriptures. But before we move, let us go to John 17, where Christ was now giving a covenant before he left earth. There's a covenant he cut with the Father. This one he did not cut with the disciples. He cut this covenant when he was praying to God and making a covenant. And that covenant was a covenant of glory. So if you can open our books to John, the Gospel of John 17. And we'll read from verse 1. Uh, I would like to read this one from the NLT version. Where it says, After saying all of these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give back the glory to you. For you have given him authority over everything. He gives eternal life to each and every one that you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, O God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent on earth. I brought glory to you on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father... Bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Did you know that Christ shared the glory with the Father before the world began? Because he was the word. John 1 tells us that he was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And this word became flesh. So that Jesus Christ we see walking in the streets of Jerusalem. He came in a form of a man. God decided in all the creatures he had made that the coming of earth I will come as a man. So look to your neighbor that you are blessed as a human being because this is the body God himself decided to dwell in when he came on earth. And he still has that body. Christ still has that body in the heavens. We see when the prophets are given visions, we see in the book of Revelations when John is testifying that I saw the one sitting on the throne resembled a picture of a man. 
And it's the same man who was resurrected. When the apostles, all those Timothy were doubting, when they saw Christ, they didn't see him as a spirit. They saw him as a man. But he was a different kind of man because he could walk through walls. He was a different kind of man because he had wore in that spiritual body. But that body in the spirit, it still resembled him. And he showed them the, the nails which were in his hands, which were the evidence that it was him who was nailed on the cross. So we are speaking about the testimony that John gave to the people around the world, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, about who we are in him. So that scripture in Revelations is not lying if it says that God has made us to be a kingdom of priests, to be a kingdom of kings. So God shared the glory with Christ before the world began. And to expound on that, I would like us to go to Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, that's the scripture really that has blessed me to see the wonderful manifestations of Christ before he was born. Who was he? Because it's so important to know who we worship. It's so important to understand who are we worshiping. He did not come as a by the way, as a man on earth. He was not among the prophets, like some religions will say. He was one of the prophets. No, he was the prophet, which Moses was told by God that he will come to save the entire world and the people of Israel. So we see him in the book of Proverbs 8 as now the one who was. Now he's the one who is, but we would like to see him now as the one who was. So if you can open our Bibles to Proverbs 8, just to understand who Christ was from the level of glory that he shared with the Father. Because he testifies in John 17 that you can now bring me back to the same level of glory we shared in the beginning. So Proverbs 8. NLT still, we are reading from the book of uh, Proverbs 8 from the NLT version. We we'll read from verse 22. Now he says, he testifies, he says, the Lord formed me from the beginning. Before he created anything else, I was appointed in ages past, at the very first before the earth began. I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters, before the mountains were formed, before the hills I was born, before he had made the earth and the fields and the first handful of soils. I was there when he established the heavens, when he threw the horizon on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above, when he established the springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits in the seas so they will not spread beyond their boundaries. And when he had marked off the earth's foundations, I was the architect in his side. Did you know that all that we see, all things visible, invisible, were conceived by Christ? Because he says, I was the architect at the right hand of the Father from the beginning. So when we read in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that Christ was the architect so he was the one meditating about what heaven should look like and all its creatures, all its stars, all its glory, all its seraphims, all its cherubims. He was the one really pondering about what really can God dwell upon. It was him who conceived the entire earth, who conceived the stars we see, the clouds, the oceans, because he testifies here. He says, I was an architect by his side. So when God made everything he made through the word, the word was indeed Jesus Christ. So this scripture tells us that John 1 is indeed true because now Christ is taking us back to the same glory he shared with the Father. Before he was crucified, he said, now bring me to the glory that we shared, which is this glory. 
right? So he was going back to heaven to take a place he had already occupied because you understand that he came to dwell among us. But the Bible says that the people didn't want to receive him. He came to his own and his own received him not. But the Bible says that to them that received him, he gave them the right to be the sons of God. He gave them the right to be the sons of God. So the right we have in the kingdom is for us to know, firstly, that we are kings in this kingdom. So we take a position as kings in this kingdom. And we should know how to demonstrate this glory from the king's point of view. And from the priest point of view. Not from a slave, not from a servant. Because Christ has said in Revelation 5.10 that therefore so that we shall reign on earth. Where to reign? On earth. Where to reign? On earth. So the life that pastor has been speaking about, a life of heaven on earth, correspond with that scripture. Because we reign here on earth. Because there is an adversary who tries and not to make you reign. There is an adversary who is always interceding for you to fail with his devils and his cohorts. But we have been given a sure word from the scriptures that we are kings and priests. So yeah, therefore we should reign. And how should we reign in life? We reign, we overcome the evil one by the words of our testimony. So it's so important to know as a king that you're fasting, that your rights are obligating you to do is to speak because your father spoke from the beginning. And we see Christ testifying that I was the architect by his side. So when God was speaking, he was speaking the words and the plan that Christ had already made. Who was an architect? An architect is a person who draws from the invisible realm that no one can see. Right? So which means Christ as the word. Christ as wisdom in the beginning had already conceived the plans of the heavens, the plans of the earth. And by the way, earth was not a by the way. Earth was there in the beginning. What we see in verse 2 is the recreation of earth. Because now earth was formless and void because the adversary, the devil, was already on earth patrolling and he was making chaos. So it was in a state of chaos, in a state of formless and it was void. But verse 1 tells us that in the beginning, God made the heavens and the, in the beginning. So in the beginning, Christ is saying that in the beginning, when God was making all of these things by speaking it to being, he was there just observing if it's according to the plan. So what I'm trying to say is that as a king, you are an architect of your life. You are an architect of the whole world. You are an architect of the whole world. The scripture that Sister Lulu was reading in the prayer service, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined, even the heart has not conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That scripture is trying to reveal to us as kings to say there is an architect plan that is in your mind, in your soul, in your heart that God has preserved for the world. He will only release that through the spirit to you. Through the spirit. Because verse 10 testifies that God has given us this spirit. We have access to these things freely because of the spirit that he has given us. Because the spirit knows the deep things of God. Right? So you are an architect. Look to your neighbor and say you are an architect. You are a king. So we have established that you are a king. Secondly, you are an architect because your Christ, which now sits in the heaven at the right hand of God, before he was flesh, before he was manifested in the flesh, if you have been to the Bible school, you will know that all things proceed from the invisible realm, from the realm of the spirit, because God is a spirit. 
and those who worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit. Right? So the Christ that you are seated, according to Ephesians, in the heavenly places far above all these principalities is the Christ in the beginning who was an architect. So everything that he walked in the street of Jerusalem is the things that was conceived by him. The throne he had left in heaven, it was full of things that he has conceived and written it down for the Father. And if you have been in this church for the very, very long time, you will know that God is Trinity, as Pastor Victor was teaching us the other day, that he is the Father, he is the Son, and he is the Holy Spirit, the same God. So he manifests himself as the Father, who is the judge, sitting upon the throne. He manifests himself as man, son of man, who came to dwell among us, full of the spirit, full of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and he dwells as a Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit he has given unto us is in our inheritance. Ephesians 1.14 confirms that the spirit that God has given us is our inheritance. Is our inheritance. So the Holy Spirit is our inheritance to use on this earth. It's a spiritual inheritance. Thus you cannot see him, but he dwells in you. He dwells upon you. And he wants you to give you that architect mindset as a king. Because a king has an influence in the domain. And the domain we are occupying is the domain of light, is the domain of glory. So we need to conceive things by the spirit that God has preserved for the entire world. Because he made a covenant to Abraham, unfortunately, believers, that through you and your seed, I shall bless all nations. All nations. All nations. And Christ came to fulfill that covenant. Because through him, all nations have an access to this God that the Jews were keeping to themselves. When you read Romans 11, you'll understand deeper about the revelations of Paul, of how the children of Israel wanted to keep God to themselves, and of how now the new believers want to keep God to themselves, and forgetting that those people of Israel had a promise, had a covenant. God has not forgotten about them. It's just he has blinded their eyes for the sake of the Gentiles that they enter into this glory, glorious kingdom. So Christ came to fulfill that covenant. And Christ, before he left back to heaven, he had given us a covenant of glory in John 17. As we are reading that, Father, the same glory that we shared in the beginning, let that glory be upon these ones. So let's continue going back to John 17 about this covenant. So we'll take some time line by line to understand the words of Christ. He was making a covenant to the Father. So this covenant has nothing to do with you. Unfortunately, it was a covenant between God, the Father, and the Son, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So this covenant by law shall come to pass in our lives. And it will only come to pass when we believe this covenant. Because sometimes we have a tendency of believing covenants of the Old Testament. And those covenants were fulfilled when Christ came on earth. Right? Because he brought grace. But there are covenants, if we look carefully, in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, that Christ and the Father were making because he had come to complete when he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. All the words that the Father had given him, he had already poured out those words. The words we will use on earth to reign as kings and priests. And he said, I will send a comforter who will tell you all truth and glorify me and the Father. So let's continue in the book of John 17, exploring this covenant of glory we have in Christ Jesus as we're reigning as kings. 
So I'll read from verse, uh, verse 6. He said, I have revealed you to the ones you have given me from this world. They were always yours. You see? He says, they were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They have accepted it and know that I come from you and they believe you have sent me because it was revealed to Peter when Christ asked, who do you think I am? Peter said, you are the Messiah. And Christ said, that did not come by physical observation. It was the Father and the Spirit that revealed that to you. Right? So in verse 9, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you all who are mine belong to you and have given them to me so they bring me glory so we bring glory to christ as the members of the body of christ we bring glory to him because he's the head when you read ephesians 5 the mystery paul was explaining to say christ is the head and we are the body the temple so before the head is fitly joined in this body, we are giving glory. Every time you are manifesting the glory of God, every time you are bringing out those gifts, using them in the ministry, using them for the world, you are bringing glory to Christ because he testifies here to say we are bringing glory to him. And he says, now I am departing, verse 11, from the world. They are staying. And indeed, we are on earth and we shall reign in life. Right? We are here on earth. Holy Father, you have given your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. Mm. So they will be united as we are. John 10, 30 says, Christ was testifying to say, I am one with the Father. As the Father he is, I am one with the Father. And he continues he says, protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of your name you have given me. I gathered them so that none was lost except the one headed for destruction. And we know who was that. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world. So they will be filled with my joy. They will be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I did not belong to the world, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is the truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I send them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them. So they can be made holy by your truth. So this is the covenant Christ was making with the Father. It's the covenant of glory. Because he says... I give them now the same glory that we had shared from the beginning. I give them the same word that you have given me. I protect them. I preserve them. And he says, sanctify them with your truth. So the words that are locked in this Bible are full of glory. Why so? Because we cannot see God because he dwells in the invisible realm. But they are prophets we have seen the glory of God that Moses was seeking. So I would like to, to remind you about the glory. When Christ says the glory that we shared in the beginning, in Proverbs 8, he's speaking about what the prophets were shown about the throne in heaven. Because most of the prophets were seeing the glory of God. And I would like you to open your Bibles to Ezekiel 1. And let's see this glory that God had shown to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1, 
We'll read from 26. For the sake of time, Ezekiel 1, 26. The glorious life we have in the kingdom. Now that we know we have a covenant of glory, now we need to know how does this glory look like? Now let's see from the book of Ezekiel 1, this glory that was shown to the prophets. 26, it says, for the previous verses, Ezekiel was describing how the hand of the Lord had taken him to the spiritual realm and show him a throne and he saw the seraphims, the cherubims, the chariots of God. And now he says in verse 26, Above this surface was something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on this throne high above was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. Whose appearance resembled a man. This was before even Christ came on earth. But the one who was in the throne, he resembled a man. So it's true, God prepared the body of a man. That's why Christ is called the Son of Man. And who is Christ? He's the express image of God, the physical image of God. Now, it says to me, if Christ is the express image of God, who are you? Because the same way he is, we are. So we are the express image of God. We are the express likeness of God. Right? So he continues. Wonderful scripture about the glory of God. So when Christ is saying, Father, I now give them the same glory that you have given me. He is talking about in the spirit, the glory that you carry. As he describes this glory in the throne of God. Verse 27. From what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like a gleaming ember, flickering like fire, and from his waist up, he looked like a burning flame, shining with splendor. All around him was a glowing halo, like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. When I saw it, I fell face down on the ground, and I heard someone's voice speaking to me. Now let's quickly go to the book of Revelations. One, we are still on the same glory that our Father, our Lord, resembles in heaven. This will make us to be established about who we are in him. Now we are coming to the glory that we are ought to be walking on this earth. But the Spirit is reminding us of the God, of the Christ who is our King of which kingdom we are. And I would like us to go to the book of Revelations 1. We'll read from verse 12. It says, When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. The previous accounts is what the Spirit had taken John to the heavenly courts, and he was shown the figure of the glory of God and the creatures in the heavens. So now he's about to describe who he saw sitting on the throne. He said, when I turn to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven God lampstands and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Man. I'm trying to get something to you. Like a son of man. And he was wearing a long rope with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were like white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet like polished bronze, refined in a, in a furnace. And his voice thundered like a mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand. And a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like a sun in all its brilliance. So you see how Moses, when he came down from the mountain, how his face shone. But we are not like Moses, who put a veil in his face for the people of God not to experience the glory of God. 
but we are in that spiritual kingdom where this glory is locked in this earthly treasure, this earthen vessels. Second Corinthians tells us that this earthly treasure is inside us. So we are not like Moses who hid the glory. Our glory is supposed to be seen by the people of God and all the people in the world. Because when they see this glory, imagine if Moses did not put a veil in his face, the story would have changed in Israel because they would have actually seen the glory of God, the same glory that Peter, John saw in the mountain when the face of Jesus while he was praying was transfigured and they saw the face of Jesus shining in all its brilliance. So Revelation is telling us about this glory we have in the Lord Jesus because now we do not see that physical glory, but his glory is in the word. We can see this glory through our faith. When we engage the scriptures, we can see the glory. As we are studying now the scriptures, we can actually see with our spiritual eyes this glory that Ezekiel is describing. We can see the glory as John is describing in the book of Revelations. We can see the same glory, but Paul says, this glory in us, this treasure is in earthen vessels. And we ought to manifest this glory that we have been given. And we'll get to that later in the day when we explore about the spiritual gift that we ought to walk as kings and prophets on this earth. Because as an inheritance was given to us to dwell in our midst in the person of the Holy Spirit, we cannot make the Holy Spirit to be dormant, right? Just like Moses in those days, the words that were given to him by God, he put those words in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder. And now we learn in the book of Deuteronomy 11 how God says, keep these words in the front lid of your eyes, write them in the doorpost, teach them to your children, by doing these things, you will make yourself prosperous. He gave the same account, testimony to Joshua. To say, this book of the law shall not depart from your mind, from your mouth. But you shall meditate upon it day and night. In that way, you will make yourself prosperous. So you see, Revelations 5.10, again, it says, God has made us to be a kingdom of priests a kingdom of kings so that we can reign in life by his word by his word because the word of god is our treasure Deuteronomy 33 explains that the word of god was a special possession in the children of israel there's nothing that they treasured the most than the word of god it became their guide and we see when they departed from believing the word of God or walking in the manifestation of the word of God, we see how God drove them to the entire earth, displacing them in the kingdoms who oppressed them. And he said, when they are in their oppressed kingdoms, when they are in exile, they will remember that they have a king. So this glorious life God wants us to live is a life that you should experience as a king, as an architect, and I would like to get into the next point as a partaker and as an inheritor. Because sometimes we think that the inheritance that God made for Israel is not applicable to us. And we forget the revelation that Paul by the Spirit gave us in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Galatians, that those who have made themselves to be in union with Christ, those who have accepted Christ, Lord Jesus, as their Lord, those are the true children of Abraham indeed. Because Abraham was justified because of his faith. In the same way pattern we have followed in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God that we have entered by believing his word, by believing the testimony that Christ came to die for our sins and by confessing it. It's the same we use now to enter his kingdom in manifesting. 
Because there are two accounts. As I read John 3, when Christ was describing to Nicodemus about how when we are born again, you shall see the kingdom of God. When we are born of water and of the spirit, you will enter the kingdom of God. Yes, most of us have entered that realm. We are in the kingdom because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are justified. You are righteous. You are acquitted of your sins. But now we need to enter into this glory. Because Galatians 4 tells us that as long as you are still a child, even though you are a king of all, you will remain as a child under a tutor, those who are put to look after you. But when the time comes that you are now a son, you shall act as a son. So we are speaking about us entering into the kingdom of God, the second one. And why I said that? Because David said, the Lord spoke once and I heard twice. So the word of God, for those who have been in the Bible school, we know about the law of the double reference. When God speaks, it's always twice. When God spoke to David, he spoke to him and he spoke to Solomon and he spoke to Jesus prophetically with one word. When he cut a covenant with Abraham, he cut a covenant with him and the descendants who will be of faith. So the word of God, that's why in Revelations, John saw a sword coming out of his mouth, a two-edged sword. So I've read in John and understood by the Spirit that to enter the kingdom of God, yes, you are in the domain of the kingdom now, but you need to enter this glorious life, this glorious presence of God that we have seen the prophets describing and John describing. Now, how do you enter? Firstly, you need to believe the words that God has given you. And I would like us to go to Ephesians 1 to really understand what God has given us. Ephesians 1, to really understand what God had, has made us to partake from before we move on. It's a scripture that has blessed my life. Ephesians 1, we, we'll read verse 3. He says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ. Because of our union with Christ, these spiritual blessings were poured upon the church. Ephesians 4 testifies that Christ left for the church five gifts, apostleships, teaching, pastoring, evangeling, evangelizing, and prophets. And we see that this gift must be used because sometimes we have this mindset that the preaching of the word is for certain people, the pastoring of the church is only for those who are called by God. It's for everyone because the covenant of Abraham and God must be fulfilled that through you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So these are the blessings that Christ has given us. The physical blessings are there for us. If I can pause on that one. The physical blessing that God gave to Abraham, they are blessings for the earth. The inheritance that Israel was given. It was the whole world and all its resources and minerals. If you read the book of Deuteronomy 33, you'll see where Moses was blessing each tribe of Israel with physical blessings. So those ones, if you have not partook of those ones, or if you have not seen the light of how you shall partake, I'm giving you as a homework. Because now we have spiritual blessings the one that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, no heart has imagined, because you are now a spiritual kingdom and there are blessings, there are things God wants us to tap to in the spiritual realm for the world. So those physical ones, you better partake of those ones because those ones 
are your birthright, in case you didn't know. Because of your union with Christ, the physical blessings, the physical inheritance is by birthright yours. Because who was Christ? He came from Judah. He was the son of God who is the heir of all things. So the physical blessings we ought to be partaking already. And if you are not walking in those physical blessings, physical inheritance, because they are your birthright, those ones are your birthright. And the spiritual blessings should be your eternal blessings, your eternal inheritance, because they came by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that we will dwell with God through his spirit forever and ever. So make sure that you partake of the physical blessings that God has read. And I'm giving you that as a homework to go and read the book of Deuteronomy. It's full of those physical blessings where God was proclaiming to the nation of Israel. And we are the Israel of God as the church. We are the church of the firstborn, which is Christ himself, who sits at the right hand of God. So all things are yours. And that one, that one, the physical one, if you have not walked on the physical one, or if you are not planning to say those ones are mine by bed right, you will struggle with the spiritual ones. Because the first one comes by believing that as you are united with Christ, they belong to you. So let's go to Ephesians 2 to really show you that the physical blessings, the glorious blessings that God proclaimed to Israel actually belongs to us. Let's read from verse 11, Ephesians 2, 11. Paul is reminding us. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ you were excluded from the citizenship of the people of Israel. King James, it says, you were an alien to the commonwealth of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God has made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. What a life. And you have been united with Christ. It says, but now, so now you have been united with Christ. Once you were far away, but now you have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Christ himself was brought, has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when his own body on the cross was crucified. And he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with all its commandments and regulations. Let's go to verse 18. It says, Now all of us can come to the Father through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done for us. So you see how do we partake in the physical blessings? By being united with Christ. We partake in this commonwealth of Israel because in Israel... There is a common wealth. So the wealth of Israel is so common that Paul had to call it common wealth. Common, common, common. So I'm trying to get to you to say if you have not walked in the physical blessings because you have to understand as a king, as God has made you a king in this kingdom is what gave birth in the first place to the nation of Israel. It was from the spirit it was from the word, invisible realm, that God appointed these people to walk in his statues. And we are now, as the first church of the firstborn, we ought to walk in those physical blessings. And I would like us now to go into the spiritual blessings that Christ has given us. So this is how, how do we partake in these things? Both the spiritual and the physical blessings. How do we partake from them? Let's go to the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. 
it gives us a picture of how do we partake in this and which kingdom we are. Book of Colossians 1. We'll read from verse 13. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, the supreme of all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God, in his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in the heavens and on earth by the means of Christ's body on the cross. So the spiritual blessings we experience come from this realm of the invisible. It comes from this realm where it manifests itself. Manifesting the God, the Father that we serve. So the Holy Spirit has given us spiritual blessings that Ephesians 1 and 1, 3 was talking about. If we open our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians 12, we see these spiritual blessings that we ought to, for the life of glory, to be manifested in this kingdom that Christ has given us. It's a marvelous scripture around what do we have in the Holy Spirit. Since it's our inheritance, we ought to know the gift that we have, and God one day will hold us accountable for this gift. In the same way, he will hold us accountable for the physical inheritances he has given us. How did we use them? Did we use them to glorify him? When you read the book of Exodus 25, you will see where Moses was given a command by God to say, go to the people of Israel, command them to give me silver, gold, linen, and all of those things, precious stones, gemstones, for the beautifying of the temple, the tabernacle. So it gives us a picture of the physical inheritance God has given us as heir of the world, what we should be doing to do, to glorify him, to beautify his church. And now these spiritual blessings that we have, as the Spirit is commanding us to walk in the same level of glory that Christ walked. Can you imagine Moses putting a veil in his face for this glory not to be manifested, whereas Jesus manifested the same glory because he came bare as a man, grew up in the temple, engaged with the scholars, called his disciples, demonstrated the kingdom of his father, what he had seen, healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking the word of God. That's the glorious life we have been called to do. And God says in Jeremiah, I reminded you, just like I reminded Jeremiah, that I said, I have called you and I have made you to be a prophet for the nations. And he said, but Lord, I'm young. He said, do not say I'm young because I will put my words in your mouth. And the words of Christ have been put in our spirit. Every time we hear the words of Christ, they bring life to us. And we're supposed to take those same words and bring life to others. So we are supposed to be kings, number one, architects, number two, inheritors, number three, and prophets, where we take the words of God. We are using the gift the Holy Spirit has given us to impact the world. That's the kingdom we're in, which is the kingdom of light, where God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, which is a life of glory. And the world is still waiting for this glorious presence from the sons of God, from the priest of God in this generation. So let us read 
and find out what are the spiritual gifts, what is this inheritance we have in Christ. So Paul is saying in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3, so I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will call Jesus a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Seven. A spiritual gift is given to each of us, not some, each of us, so we can help each other, number one. Number two, to one, the, sp the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice or counsel. So you see the Spirit manifesting itself in different ways, and it manifests to us. And he does that manifest to us for ourselves. He manifests to us so he can edify the next person next to you, the whole world. And he says, verse 8, to one person the spirit gives the ability for the wise wisdom. To another the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same spirit gives the great faith to another. To someone else the spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and to another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and the only Spirit who distributes all these gifts and he alone decides which gifts each person should have at any given point in time so as you are in the spirit praying in tongues because that's where you understand now that god is communing with you when you are speaking in other tongues you are in the spirit we see from the scriptures even john he says in john in Revelations 1, I was in the Spirit. While I was in the Spirit, I was taken up to the heavens. Same as a kill we've read, being shown the glory of God. If you read verse 1, he says, in the 11th year, while I was in the river, what he was doing in the river? Praying. The hand of the Lord came to take him up unto the heavens. The same way David wrote the whole plan of the temple. He was in the spirit because he testifies when he gives the plan to his son to say, the hand of the Lord has given me this plan. And it says, I shall do as I've been shown. So it gives us a picture to say every time we are in the spirit, we are exciting God because now the spirit helps us to get into the mind of God, which knows the deep secrets the deep secret of God that he has preserved for those who love him. And in closing, I would like to remind you of how Moses, because I said in the beginning, we should demonstrate this glory. Same thing God commanded Moses in the book of Numbers. He said when he was giving instruction, when the people were murmuring, complaining, about thirst in the wilderness, God said to him, go and speak to the rock and water will come out for the people of Israel to drink. And Moses, out of anger, he goes and strikes the rock. And this is what God says. Let's go to Numbers. So we can quote it directly from the scripture, the book of Numbers. The life of glory is about the life of demonstrating the holiness of God. The holiness of God. 1 Corinthians 12 has reminded us that the Spirit, as He wills, gives this gift to each and one of us. He didn't say to some. So all of the gifts we have read, wisdom, knowledge, unknown tongues, 
miracles, healing. The spirit expects those gifts to fall upon each and every one of us because we are all members been given different kind of gifts. And this is how you demonstrate the holiness of God by speaking the words. Because he has said in Joel 2, 28, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh as sons and daughters shall prophesy. Right? He says I will open up visions and dreams for young men and old men. He was speaking about the life in the spirit using those spiritual gifts he has given us. And I would like to close by taking us back to how a man angered God in failing to demonstrate his holiness. Because we see in the beginning God giving a command to Moses to say, take a stick in the presence of Pharaoh, put the stick down, it will turn into a snake. It came to pass when the children of Israel encountered the Red Sea, they were crying. What did God say? Straight out your staff and your rod. And the seed departed in half. So God was now, after they were out in Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, God was dealing them in the physical realm. Because Moses had a rod. But the book of Numbers were in the wilderness now. Because why did he drive them to the wilderness? To teach them. So they could know him, know his ways. Because in the wilderness, there was no pharaoh, there was no plants, there was no houses. That's where God now demonstrated his true holiness. And Moses is stopping this. So God was very angry with Moses and Aaron to say, you have failed to demonstrate my holiness because I said speak to the rock in the presence of the people and you strike the rock, you still use the physical you still walk according to the flesh God was now calling them higher to say and reminding them how he had told Moses in the beginning how he made the world because it was Moses who gave us an account in Genesis how God was speaking things to be now because of unbelief not knowing God, the true God, God allowed them to use a staff and a rod. But now he wanted to bring them to a high level of glory where things are spoken and they are be. Because he says in Mark eleven twenty three, if you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, it shall be removed. He was not speaking lies because he knew that as a father he speaks when he wants things. But Moses fails to demonstrate this holiness. So let's go to the book of Numbers 20. We'll read because of time of the account. We're not going to read the whole account. I'm sure you know the whole account. But we'll read from verse 12. Where God now was speaking to Moses and Aaron. About what they failed to do. Numbers. Book of Numbers 20. So you see, we need invisible microphones. <laughs> invisible microphones. Verse 20, it's chapter 20, verse 12. Still from the NLT version. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them unto the promised land I am giving them. This is the place which was known as the waters of Meribah, as we know. God says, because we have failed to demonstrate my holiness, you do not trust me enough. I told you when you go to chapter 2, uh, verse 2, right? let's read from verse 2. It says, there was no water from the people to drink in that place. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses and said, If only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers, why have you brought us, this congregation of the Lord's people, into the wilderness to die along with our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here into this terrible place in the wilderness? 
this is the land which has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no promagates, and no water or drink. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and they went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared before them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the people of Israel, the whole community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water for the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff, placed it where it's kept from the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather themselves. Listen, you rebels. Now his response. <laughs> so these people have angered him. He goes back to God. God says, just speak to the rock. So God could have said, speak to the ocean. It will depart in half. So you see why God was now bringing them to the level of glory by speaking. So which means we could interpret where God said, raise up your rod and the Red Sea will depart in half. God, because of their unbelief and because of their revelation of who God was, God could have said to them, speak to the ocean and the water will depart in half and walk. But because of unbelief, he had just said, take the rod and raise it up. And who was speaking? God spoke. He said the ocean blew in half from the nostrils of the Spirit of God and it departed in half. So which means God spoke on their behalf. God has spoken on our behalf. We need to believe those words and proclaim it. So that's how we demonstrate the holiness of God, by speaking. Jesus said, if you shall say, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed. And we see Jesus Christ himself, he encountered a fig tree. No fruit. What did he do? He spoke. Everywhere he went, he used to speak. When the people didn't have food in the wilderness, where they were, he said, gave thanks, spoke, multiplied the fishes and the loaves. Right? When he healed people, he spoke. <laughs> he spoke. So a life of a king is about speaking. And God says, we are not like that people of Israel who used to belong in a physical mountain. We are now belonging in a spiritual mountain, in Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, where we speak. So a life of a king is like a life of a prophet. Because we see in the Old Testament, prophet and king used to be twins. There was no king without a prophet. But now, because of the Holy Spirit God has given us, as an advocate, we are able to tap in his realm and speak and things. So if you thought the life of glory is a life of seeing the glory of God, as Ezekiel saw, as Daniel saw in chapter 7, the life we have now is locked in this earthen vessel. When we speak, we declare the glory of God. When we prophesy over people's life, when we use these spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us, distribute to us, we are demonstrating the holiness of God. And that brings glory to God, our Father. It brings glory to Jesus because he said, the works that I do, greater works you will do. Why he was saying that? Because he knew the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in you because the kingdom of God is not over there, over there. It's in your midst. It's in you. So do not look for physical manifestations where we want to see God like Moses. He said, show me your glory. But we learn in Hebrews 12, the mountain we are on is Mount Zion, the spiritual mountain where this treasure is locked in this earthen vessel. This light of God 
of the kingdom we have inherited is a kingdom of light, Colossians tells us. And this kingdom of light needs to spring forth in different ways, in different functions. So if in your office, for example, in your business, people are not rallying to you because of the wisdom you have, the knowledge you have, you need to pray more, desire more of the Holy Spirit so that you walk in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit, as First Corinthians says, too, that we know now these things that God has freely given us by his Spirit, because the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And these things are spiritually discerned from the world, from the unbelievers, only by the Spirit. And he ends, he says, because we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That's why the scripture says, be holy as your Father is holy. And how do you demonstrate that holiness? How do you demonstrate this glory? It's by speaking. Speaking. A life of a king. A life of an architect. Even here on earth. As he speaks. This is not what I expected the building to be upon. So your life is a life characterized by the glory of God. Which is locked in his word. Which is locked in his spirit. And is spiritually discerned. No one can tap into the realm except you. Because God has made you a son because of your union with Christ. He has made you to be the heir of his kingdom. God expects so much for us to walk in this holiness. To demonstrate his holiness. Every time you heal the sick, you are demonstrating his holiness. Because how do we heal the sick in this dispensation? We speak. Be thou healed. Come up and walk. We speak. We speak. We speak. A life of a believer is a life of speaking words from God. And we have seen our Lord Jesus Christ speaking when he was on earth. We have seen him speaking before he came on earth because he was the word himself. And we have seen him speak forever because he says, My words will last unto eternal life. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words. So I came to remind you tonight that the life of glory that God is expecting us to walk on this earth is characterized by words. So you should make the word of God as your special possession. The spirit of God, that treasure that God has put, has sealed in your spirit, it's your treasure. With those two things, you will reign in life. With those two things, you will make the whole world to be turned upside down. Because we have a spiritual kingdom where things which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, are locked in that spiritual realm. But the Christians are supposed to tap in that spiritual realm by the Spirit. By the Spirit. So a life of a believer is by the Spirit, by faith, by the words of God. So before I depart, I would like to repeat, demonstrate the holiness of God. Do not be like Moses who put a veil in his face to demonstrate the physical glory of God. He also failed to demonstrate the holiness of God by speaking to the rock. And Paul tells us in the book of, of, uh, of Corinthians that that rock that the people of Israel used to walk in the wilderness with providing water, that rock was Christ because he is a spiritual rock He's the chief cornerstone in the foundations of the church. He's the chief cornerstone. So that rock that Moses stroke was Christ himself. And God had said, speak to the rock. Speak to Christ as your high priest. As you speak to him, he unveils all his inheritances. He unveils every promise that God has made you to, to be a partaker. Walking in divine nature. So the secret of the kingdom of God is not a matter of physical things. We have said this, you lack nothing. The physical blessings as you read in the Old Testament are yours by birthright. Never forget that. Are yours by birthright. The blessings of the new covenant 
are yours for eternity. With those words, I would like us to glorify God, just standing up and lifting our hands of this special treasure, of this life of glory that he has given us, locked in his word and locked in his spirit that we should walk. So just take some time, two minutes, just appreciating God for what he has done for us. This special treasure locked in your earthly vessel, the Holy Spirit himself. God was pleased to dwell in you fully by his spirit. And God is pleased to dwell in you by his word. And you need to demonstrate this holiness for the entire world. The entire world, every nation, every tribe need to see the physical manifestations of the spirit of God in us as kings and prophets and priests. The world, because when we do that, the Abrahamic covenant is being fulfilled. The Abrahamic covenant is being fulfilled. Every time we do that, we are coming to the fullness of who Christ is. The full stature of who Christ is. And we are coming to the same measure of faith. The same unity of faith that God has given us. Just appreciate him. You can pray in tongues just for two minutes. Appreciating, tapping into this realm. Walking in the spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for walking us in divine nature. Thank you for the promises, precious promises you have given us in your kingdom of light, oh Lord Jesus. Thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Ghost himself, who is our inheritance in here on earth, and we shall reign on earth, O oh Lord, demonstrating your holiness, thereby living a life of glory, that the world can see that indeed we are called by the name of our Father, who is the Father of all spirits, the same Father who gives birth to every child here on earth. is the same Father who is the Father of the Spirit in the heavens, the Spirit on earth. So we give you glory, O Lord Jesus Christ, for the glorious presence you have given us. And we are prophetically saying, King of glory, as Psalm 24 put it, we are letting you in, O Lord. As the King of glory in our lives, we have entered your kingdom the domain of your kingdom, which is a domain of love, of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now we enter into the domain of glory where we speak your words as prophets like you told Jeremiah to speak your words, your same word that you told Ezekiel to speak to the children of Israel. The same word you have given to us, O Lord. We are saying, let the King of glory come in our lives Come, King of glory, open up ancient gates. And one of the gates that you can open up is your mouth. Your mouth is the gate where this glorious life is manifested for all the world. Thank you, O oh Lord. We open up all our gates, our mouth, our ears, our eyes. We are saying, come in, King of glory. And who is the King of glory? It is the Lord Almighty, the Holy One of Israel. He is the King of glory, seated upon the throne at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the glorious life we have called us as kings and priests unto eternal life. It's a privilege to approach your throne, to minister in your presence, O Lord. It's a privilege and an honor to be called priests and kings. We glorify you, O Lord, until you give us a perfect statue of you are, going deeper in the spirit. Blessings and glory are yours and honor and power and dominion. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. What a glorious life the Lord has called us to live.